Uh, hi, and welcome to this uh, week's special edition of The Prince Crosshairs. As you know, we usually uh, do one show a week, uh, but we've got a second one this week because of the unfolding economic crisis in Pakistan. Uh, we've had a lot of people write in and ask uh, if we could unpack what's going on there a little more. Not always clear, quite confusing. And we're privileged to have with us Ozair Yunus, who uh, is one of the smartest guys on all things Pakistan economy, uh, consultant, economist, um, and uh, someone who's been watching events unfold uh, uh, very, very closely. Uh, so I'll get to the nub of this. Uh, Ozair, uh, news uh, last week that uh, Pakistan Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif saying that Pakistan uh, is has finally decided to or has no option other than to sign on to IMF uh, conditionalities. Uh, I, I understand there was a lot of reluctance in this government to come on board with these terms and conditions. Can you explain a little bit about why if Pakistan needs this cash so badly, uh, why, why it was so reluctant to accept the terms that came from the lender? Um, uh, for this deal. Well, thanks for having me. And, and look, I'll start with the fact that um, much of the reluctance stems from uh, the political implications of uh, agreeing to the IMF's conditions. Um, this is a program that began in 2019 when Imran Khan was prime minister. And even he was reluctant after coming to power in August 2018 uh, to quickly go to the IMF and get a program uh, in place uh, to get things going. Uh, famously, uh, if you go back in time at that point, um, Asad Omar, who had sort of uh, been in this role as shadow finance minister, everybody knew if PTI or Khan never came to power, Asad Omar would be the finance minister, was let go of. Uh, for his uh, failure in so many ways uh, to negotiate this agreement. And then uh, Hafiz Sheikh uh, came in. Um, Hafiz Sheikh, who is no stranger to negotiating with the IMF, has always rescued uh, governments across the board in various times, uh, brought the program back on track. That program uh, was once suspended during COVID um, and then resumed in February uh, 2022, right before the Khan government went out. Um, but the challenge uh, as as sort of a new government led by Shabazz Sharif came in was to unwind some of the decisions that Khan himself had taken, most famously the petroleum subsidy he had provided, um, which was unfinanced um, right before he left power or was removed from power. Um, the Sharif government took almost two months uh, to unwind this, even though they knew that this was going to be a sticking point. Um, and then as the political Political implications of higher inflation, higher energy prices, lower economic growth um, uh, entered the fray. Um, an internal tug of war within the PMLN in particular uh, broke out, which is when we saw Dr. Mifta Ismail, a PhD in economics, uh, who understands some of these issues very, very closely in terms of the economic situation in Pakistan, uh, was removed. Um, uh, as finance minister and Ishaq Dar, a relative of the Nawaz family, uh, the Sharif family, came in, flew in from London and took over the helm of the finance ministry in September 2022. Um, that political uh, resistance, so to speak, has continued uh, to this day where, you know, what was demanded back when Mifta Ismail was finance minister and what had been agreed upon in his negotiations with the IMF was delayed. And now Pakistan and the prime minister have no choice uh, but to accede to the IMF's demand. And in, in my opinion, they're, they're pushed back saying that the IMF is being very difficult or very strict. Um, you know, is a bit of a cop out. It's not true. All the IMF is saying is you agree to certain things and you need to follow through on them. So I'm going to come back to the, the strictness of these terms in just a second. But, uh, you know, if I'm not wrong, Pakistan has since the 1950s been to the IMF some 22 times, if I'm, if I'm uh, not very wrong. Is this loan a solution to a problem or is it just part of a fix for a problem. We've heard, uh, you know, we've seen articles saying that uh, the real problem is that Pakistan doesn't export enough, that it spends too much on subsidies, uh, and that this cash bailout will, will help, but it's not going to fix the problem. Could, could you unpack that a little bit for us? 
Sure. Um, yeah, it's been it's been to the IMF close to two dozen times. I, it's hard to remember the full count uh, because it's been happening so many times. In fact, Isagdar himself famously said, I have experience negotiating with the IMF because I've been doing it for 25 years. <laughs> he said it as a matter of pride. Um, to which my point was it's nothing to be proud about. Like, you know, if you're going, if you're, if you as a finance minister and so many times dealt with the IMF, it's actually an indictment of your own performance, but that's beside the point. Um, in terms of where the IMF comes in, look, it is basically the lender of last resort that helps stabilize the economy. Um, and the parallel in this discussion, right, is, is India. When India went to the IMF in the early 90s, it helped stabilize the economy, but then it was up to Indian policymakers to restructure and reorient their economy, liberalize, end the license Raj regime, etc. And India is a thriving economy that the world wants to invest in today. Um, in Pakistan, that has not happened. What has happened is that time and time again, successive governments um, have agreed to the IMF's uh, program and terms uh, only to renege on them uh, quite quickly. Um, in fact, out of the nearly two dozen programs that Pakistan has been in, it has only successfully completed one of them, which was Ishaq Dar's last one in 2014 to 2017 when it was completed. But within a, a year of completion of that program, Pakistan was back to the IMF because everything was unwound and the situation was quite dire in 2018. Um, so I think it's been a reluctance of Pakistan's a political and ruling elite, political and military elite, um, to not recognize that the days of extracting geopolitical rents are over, um, that they need to reorient their economy and be a modern economy that is linked to the rest of the world, that is drawing in investments into productive sectors. Um, and their refusal to do that uh, is primarily the reason why the country keeps going back to the IMF. The IMF is not saying that Pakistan should you know, to have a regressive taxation system. It keeps saying successive programs keep saying widen the tax base. Well, widening the tax base is up to the political elite and they refuse to do that because the first people who would have to pay the higher tax rate in that equitable system would be the elites themselves. Yes. So as someone old enough to remember India going to the IMF in the, those very troubled months, uh, I, I remember that they weren't, you know, at the time, hugely popular with Indians. There were hikes in prices across the board, um, uh, you know, things like bus fares for the first time went up and there was a huge hoo-ha about it. And that was at a time when India, let's say, you know, was not as dependent on imported goods as it, as it is today. I assume that for Pakistani politicians, there's also a dilemma here, which is that if you do what the IMF is asking you, raise prices, reduce subsidies, uh, you know, jack up taxes for everyone, this, this is not going to be something that's going to make a politician love, right? Absolutely. And I think this is the fundamental challenge in particular with the current negotiations going on, because what's happened since the end of the Musharraf dictatorship um, is that every new government has gone to the IMF. So we saw in 2008, the People's Party coalition did that. In 2013, it was the PMLN. In 2018, it was the PTI. But in this instance, Shabash Sharif has to agree to the IMF's terms um, at a time when within, at the most, within the next four to five months, he has to go to the polls. Um, Imran Khan is agitating for early elections. The Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa Assembly stand dissolved. So in this instance, when, you know, inflation is about to reach 40%, if the IMF's, uh, you know, agreement uh, terms are met, which they have to be, um, going to the polls in that instance is not a recipe for success. Any politician knows that. Um, but again, my view on this is that the prime minister and his party themselves are to blame here because had they continued on the path um, that Dr. Mifta Ismail had agreed to back in the summer of 2022, by now all of the things that the IMF was demanding had already happened. Inflation would have peaked and you would have made the case to the people that we've stabilized the economy from the disaster of Imran Khan. That's the narrative they could have gone with. Um, now they're basically saying all of it is Imran Khan's fault. Well, almost a year has passed by since he was removed from office. And as you very well know, and your listeners know, uh, constituents have short term memory loss. Um, they now don't remember how things or what things were like in the Khan era. They remember that over the last eight months, prices have shot through the roof and their purchasing power has been eroded significantly.
So I, I hear fascinating uh, things. And by the way, uh, for our viewers, some great articles from Mifta Ismail, who's been writing in public uh, on this issue, just Google them, or we'll, we'll try and post some um, links uh, in 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 in, in uh, on YouTube. Uh, but one of the things he says is that look, uh, this problem hasn't come about because of just ordinary people. You've had some structural inefficiencies like subsidies uh, to big uh, public sector corporations, industries, airlines, and uh, of course this big uh, gantu and spender, the military, um, and. Ordinary people in Pakistan would be justified in saying, would they not, that look, uh, you dug this hole. Now you're expecting us uh, to sort of pay the price for clawing our way out. That doesn't seem very fair, uh, does it? No, absolutely not. And I think that's been, uh, you know, even my own argument in the discourse has been, and I'll give your audience a couple of examples, um, the total loss and damages of the floods, the catastrophic floods in 2022 monsoon season are about $30 billion. Um, Pakistan, according to the UNDP, um, spends or gives out handouts, perks, privileges, roughly about $17.5 billion a year to elites in society. Um, so one could say that roughly you know, two years worth of handouts to the rich would cover the loss and damages of a catastrophe that has afflicted. A few weeks ago, Dar sort of came on TV and said, we're going to cut petroleum prices by four rupees a liter because we want to give relief to the people. Now, if you actually do the analysis on in terms of energy consumption per capita in Pakistan, for an average citizen, um, that relief was worth two nans a month for their whole household. Right, uh, right. Six people in an average household, your okay. relief is two a month. But if you own a land cruiser and you have a convoy of cars that you use to commute to your factory and back, that's 200 to 300 nans. So your relief actually is giving 300 nans to the rich man with a Land Cruiser V8 car and a convoy of security guards um, and two nans to the average citizen. And oh, by the way, when the peg breaks and inflation goes through the roof because you followed a disastrous policy, inflation hurts the poor the most. Wow, that, that's quite a staggering time. number. That's a really staggering number. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. So to restructure that, I mean, you know, really want to restructure the economy. It's not that there aren't resources in it. It's that the resources are flowing to the wrong people. And I'll give you another example. This recently broke in Pakistani news because a case is ongoing. Um, Lahore Jim Khanna. Uh, in in Lahore um, is, you know, where the elites go to play bridge and hang out and play squash and all of that, much like Delhi or Mumbai has the similar gymkhanas as well. However, um, the Lahore gymkhana has a multi-year lease. I think it was a 50-year lease that was signed where they pay 5,000 rupees a year um, in rent to the government. Um, I asked some friends of mine who are in the real estate sector. Well, if this was a market-based uh, uh, rent that was demanded, what would it be? And their answer was it would be at least 30 crore a month. Um, wow. That would be paid. <laughs> and I did the math. So now, now let me do the, the other uh, flip side of this, this math. When I did that math and said, well, assume that you pay 6,000 rupees a month as a stipend for students get needing a good education. That's 50,000 students worth of monthly salary that is being stolen from them for the playground of the rich. Um, right. And that debate is going on in Pakistan. And people like Mifta Ismail have flagged it out, even though he himself is an elite. He's an industrialist. Um, but many are beginning to argue that enough is enough. There is, There are resources in this country. It's just that you choose not to tax and not to take out resources from the few. Uh, and in, in, in successive IMF programs, you decide to put a bigger and bigger burden on the many, even though they have nothing to do in creating this crisis. So I want to, you mentioned General Musharraf's years in office. And again, you know, the way I think most Indians will remember uh, it from the headlines, was that, hey, Pakistan was doing really well at that time. We were we had all these articles about the booming stock exchange and how General Musharraf uh, was creating a modern reformed economy. Um, firstly, was that impression correct? And if it was correct, what went wrong? 
Well, so see, some reforms and some action was taken indeed by the Musharraf years. Um, exports grew. Um, there was more investment coming in. Um, a, a pretty good local bodies system was introduced to devolve power to the local level. I'm, I grew up in Karachi and Karachi has this weird romance with General Musharraf to this day, um, <laughs> right? Because they always, you will hear them, Musharraf ka zamana cha is a frequent line you will hear in drawing rooms out of Karachi, at least Karachi and other parts of the countries too as well um but see this is linked to that boom like previous booms um people forget was linked to the fact that pakistan at that time was closely allied to the united states um there was a paris club debt restructuring right after 9 11 prior to that the economy was in the dumps um the dollars then began flowing in because the pakistan was a frontline ally state of the united states in the war on terror next door in afghanistan um and this is a pattern we saw a similar growth boom happen in the ayub era we saw a similar boom happen in the ziaul haq era and then, as you said, in the Musharraf era, the challenge was that once these rents, geopolitical rents, as we described them, ended, uh, you kind of very quickly found out that the economic growth was really nothing. Um, and so it was the same thing with the Musharraf era. By the time he was out, um, there was a huge current account deficit, 18-hour power crisis in major cities, forget about small towns and villages, um, uh, terrorism through the roof. And so the country paid a huge price for the short-term spate uh, of growth that he had generated in alliance with the United States. And when the dollar stopped flowing in, um, the economy sort of collapsed. And then the next boom came in 2013 onwards uh, when the Chinese decided to. Right. So I right? wanted so to ask this, about that because this... we also saw all these headlines about trillions of dollars with CPAC, roads and railway lines. And then all of that suddenly seemed to disappear somewhere. What, what, what happened? Yeah, so I think that, that, that again is a, a less, you know, people uh, in the West and in India use the term debt trap diplomacy quite frequently. And I kind of disagree with the broad use of that term in this sense. Look, Pakistan borrowed uh, money from the Chinese to build power plants, which Pakistan needed. As I said, 18-hour load shedding. Uh, it used it to develop a pretty good road and highway infrastructure, which is needed in any economy to connect. Um, but then the challenge is domestically, how do you reorient and restructure the economy to effectively utilize that infrastructure, right? I.e. exports in any any developing economy. So that's let how let me just Let me just get this right for my understanding and those of my viewers. If I build a road, I need to create industries which will send out trucks to use that road and carry their goods to ports which are taken alone to build and so on. Exactly. Especially if, you know, if let's say in the Indian case, the roads are built through rupee denominated debt taken out by the government in domestic, out of the domestic economy, then it can be about internal market goods, right? That you can sell something from Maharashtra to Uttar Pradesh or whatever. Um, in the case of Pakistan, because the debt was taken out in dollar terms, you have to earn dollars to pay it back which doubles down right. on the thing that you have to export. Now, if you don't reorient your economy and instead of promoting capital intensive manufacturing uh, that, that is globally competitive, instead you allow amnesties to happen, for example, in the real estate sector where there is currently a casino economy, has been a casino economy in Pakistan for a number of years now, that's unproductive. So you borrowed in dollars, you have to pay back dollars, but you haven't done anything to earn those dollars in the meantime. And that has what has exacerbated this crisis because Pakistan has to pay the world back in dollars, but it has not been able to earn as much dollars as it should have catalyzed by those same investments in infrastructure. So on this uh, specific issue of China, we've, we've heard Sri Lanka uh, and some people in Pakistan complain that, you know, China hasn't been doing enough uh, to forgive debt or reschedule debt. Uh, that it hasn't been generous with understanding the impact the pandemic years uh, had on these countries. In your view, that is not the whole part or, or the whole story. Correct. And it is not the whole story in the sense that in Pakistan, you're seeing a similar response from the Saudis uh, as the Chinese and the Emiratis and the Qataris, which is what is your plan? Um, and we want you to reform your economy. And this has been consistently stored at Davos by the Saudis, for example, most recently, but even in private conversations that Pakistan is a friend. We want to see a stable Pakistan. Even the Americans say it. 
But the point then is, what is your own plan to reform your economy and restructure it such, such that um, you stabilize, right? Nobody wants to, in today's world, keep putting money into a country that basically burns it away or gambles it away because a finance minister, in this case, Isaac Dar, for example, follows through on disastrous policies of pegging the currency, right? You will end up where you are because of policies like that. And Pakistan's friends, including China, are saying, we will help you, but why don't you first sort your own house in order and show us a credible plan that you're willing to follow through on? And the first step of that is getting back into the IMF program. So I, I want to understand a little bit more about this difference of opinion between Mifta Ismail and uh, Ishaq Dar on this dollar question. Now, as I understand it crudely as a layperson, uh, Ishaq Dar's argument was basically that if we prop up the rupee, uh, we pay less for our fuel imports. Uh, that keeps prices low for uh, ordinary people, reduces inflation. Why, why is that unsound thinking? Why did that lead to this sort of meltdown of the rupee anyway? Well, see, because, uh, you know, if you look at a country like India or the East, East Asian economies that built, a, you know, a firewall of reserves after the 1998 financial crisis, um, you can manage your currency if you have 100, 200, 300 billion dollars in reserves. You can spend some of them to stabilize the economy. But when you don't have dollars and you can't generate more dollars, how are you going to keep the price of a currency pegged, number one? That was the fundamental economic question that people asked Mifta. In fact, my own career um, in terms of focusing on the economy began with a long read on in October 2018, critiquing, 2016, critiquing Isaac Dar's peg at that point in time. And here we are back to this question that you just asked six, seven years later. Um, but the other problem with the, the whole idea, as you said, right, you keep the price pegged, it lowers uh, the cost of imports, particularly fuel. Um, that essentially is the problem with that policy in the sense that price is a signal. So if you're giving consumers the uh, a 20 percent discount by keeping your currency artificially more expensive or keeping the dollar cheaper, People will consume more of that thing because it's cheaper. Um, and you saw that in when Imran Khan cut prices to the fuel subsidy, consumption went through the roof. When Ishaq Dar decided to peg the currency, people had this view that, you know, things are cheap. We can keep continuing with the path that we're on. And the third element of this where things got messed up was that the decision to prop up the currency was done by rationing imports, which meant that now you had a Soviet-style bureaucratic economy where the central bank got a list every day from different banks uh, saying, well, here's the 100 things we need to clear as imports. And the bank would say, well, do 25 of them, ignore the other 75. All of a sudden, that led to distortions across the economy, where now you see Toyota has shut down its production, Miller Tractors has shut down its production. Virtually every single uh, industry is operating significantly below capacity at this point in time. Why? Because you introduced import rationing as a means to prop up the currency. And oh, by the way, you violated the agreement you had with the IMF, which was that you would run a market determined exchange rate, which in my view was always the right policy because it allows you to tell the public as imports grow, and reserves decline, that things get excessive and you need to cut the consumption of imported necessities. Uh, you refuse to send that signal. And now, as we were talking about earlier, there will be uh, uh, an upwards adjustment of prices because the dollar finally is finding its true market value. Um, so my last question, but one, um, uh, is, is really this. Um, Shabash Sharif now agreeing, saying there's no other way, we've got to do this, it's, you know, uh, uh, no options left. Uh, the clock's ticking. Do you expect progress? I know you're not sort of sitting in uh, some IMF conference room, but do you, do you have a time frame or a sense of, of how long we are talking about for the deal to be done? Or are there still things to be hammered out and negotiated? 
there is a lot to be hammered out and negotiated but they basically have 72 or 48 hours february 9th is sort of when the delegation is expected to leave and there should be and the market is watching uh for the announcement of a staff level agreement with the imf a lot of stuff has not yet been hashed out for example uh the plan on what they call the circular debt management plan is essentially a plan for the power sector um to you know reduce the amount of debts that being built up in that power sector the imf wants a credible plan uh, as of sunday um to my conversations a credible plan had not been presented and the agreement was still far off and, and the circular an debt issue to understand I, I think is one that will be familiar to many indians it's where we as consumers don't pay enough uh for the price of the fuel that gets passed on to the distribution company which passes on that debt to the production company it just sort of turns into an endless loop absolutely um, would that basically absolutely. be it yeah, okay. That's exactly it. Um, and India has that in the distribution sector of its electricity system as well. Um, now, so that has to be hashed out. There is a tax uh, addition tax uh, budget, uh, impact that has to be hashed out. Um, there are details around the withdrawal of certain subsidies that have to be hashed out. So there's still a lot on the agenda, but this is the crucial week. If there is no agreement uh, by this week, um, already uh, the oil and fuel industry has said last week um, that they have not been able to open new letters of credit to import fuel because banks are refusing to honor that commitment, uh, which means that Pakistan roughly has two weeks worth of uh, excess supplies of fuel. Um, so if there's no agreement this week, uh, by next week, you will begin to see fuel shortages in Pakistan. As I said, the supply chain already has been significantly distorted. Toyota, others have shut down production. Um, and so if we do not have a positive uh, uh, sort of communication on the agreement by February 9th, um, all hell will can break loose in Pakistan. And my final question, I can't uh, escape this question in an India-Pakistan uh, conversation, sadly. Uh, but how important is trade with India? We've seen some sort of comments about this saying, you know, it's time to uh, just put Kashmir to one side for now. And if we can buy cheap tomatoes, then buy cheap tomatoes or whatever, whatever else. Uh, is that a small part of the puzzle, a big part of the puzzle? Can you give us a sense of what this actually means? Look, I think this is, again, basic uh, economic common sense, right, that no countries or no regions in the world can thrive and, and become developed without integrating with each other. Um, and my view is the same between India and Pakistan. India is a huge economy, uh, has significant uh, production capabilities and capital that can be, you know, have a positive impact on Pakistan. Pakistan, um, and we need to move toward normalizing trade. Um, there were a couple of at least two opportunities in the recent past that I think were let go off, unfortunately, uh, at the cost of the people of India and Pakistan, because politics came in the way. And I think in Pakistan, there is a broader sentiment uh, growing um, that why not trade with India? Uh, why not allow the flow of goods and people uh, and normalize things? And yes, Kashmir is a dispute and Kashmir can be talked about and should be talked about. Uh, but, you know, China does trade with Taiwan, uh, even though it doesn't recognize Taiwan, right? So if right. the Chinese can do it, if the Saudis can do it with Israel and the Emiratis can do it with Israel, why not India and Pakistan? And I think um, it would broadly benefit uh, the people of both countries, especially Pakistan. But I think I would also add that this is this is not just the only thing that will solve Pakistan's problems. Pakistan's problems first need to be solved by restructuring its own economy and taking the resources that are currently handed out to the few, um, take them away and give them to the many, because without that, we will continue going down this cycle of IMF programs time and time again. So thank you, Zed. I mean, my takeaway as an Indian looking at this crisis next door is, of course, to worry about what happens. Pakistan... Uh, all said and done, a very large country, uh, and whatever happens there will have consequences, whether it's economically integrated or not with India. Uh, but also as a cautionary tale, because uh, you know the, the fascinating part of this story is how often politicians put off uh, giving the bitter pill to their voters, only for those problems to build up and build up and build up. And, and I think there's a cautionary tale there. Uh, we've seen countries uh, from Sri Lanka to Myanmar to Pakistan now sort of end up down this trajectory. Uh, and probably voters, citizens should be paying a lot more attention to this. 
much as I might deeply resent paying my taxes, there's probably a reason I should be doing so um, for the good of my kids and uh, my community. Uh, so thank you very, very much for joining us. I know it's an unearthly and early hour of the morning for you. Uh, but thank you, and we look forward to having you back on uh, Crosshairs whenever you can make the time. Uh, thank you, Zed. No, would would love to come back on, and again, thank you, thank you for having me on.